Intimate Judaism deals with sensitive topics and uses explicit language. Listener discretion is advised. Before we begin our episode today of Intimate Judaism, I'd like to give the microphone over to our sponsor for this episode, My Shemen. This episode of Intimate Judaism is brought to you by My Shemen Pleasure Massage Oil. My Shemen is a new natural and safe lubricant designed to help with relaxation and arousal. It is composed of multiple oils, including cannabis, to help reduce muscle tension, improve blood flow, and stimulate sexual responsiveness. My Shemin oil works in harmony with your body's natural mechanisms, soothing and stimulating blood flow to achieve a strong aphrodisiac effect. My Shemin is a great tool for couples who want to explore sensual touch, as well as for any couple that wants to try something new in order to improve and enhance their intimate experiences. My Shemin is located in Israel and can be shipped all over the world. It's approved by the Israel Ministry of Health, and a single bottle can be used between 30 and 50 times. Go to the show notes for this episode at IntimateJudaism.com, where you can find a link to order. Or go to myshemen.co.il. That's M-Y-S-H-E-M-E-N dot C-O dot I-L to help you and your partner improve and enhance your intimate experience. Welcome to Intimate Judaism. I'm Rabbi Scott Kahn. And I'm Tali Rosenbaum. And today we have a very exciting and stimulating episode. We're going to be talking about enhancing our sex lives. And uh, we have a very special guest who I'm going to introduce shortly. Make sure you visit our website, IntimateJudaism.com, for the full podcast archive, show notes, a free men's mikvah list, and more. Please continue to send us your questions and comments right to IntimateJudaism at JewishCoffeeHouse.com. Also, please visit TaliRosenbaum.com and JewishCoffeeHouse.com. Tali and I are very excited about the great bonus episodes we have planned for Patreon subscribers. Remember that this podcast is free, and we're very happy that it's free. If you want to support the podcast and get bonus material, episodes, merch, and more, Check out the Patreon link in the description of this podcast, click on it, and sign up today. You'll help us, and you'll benefit too. And the coolest part is this. This is a podcast, not a radio show, which means that unlike commercial radio, you can press pause, and we'll wait for you. So do it right now, and then come back and listen. We're going to wait for you right now. One final announcement before we begin our episode. I get emails all the time from people who would like to start their own podcast. So when I'm not producing or co-hosting Intimate Judaism or Baseball Rabbi or Orthodox Conundrum, I'm often producing podcasts for other people, or I help them learn how to do it themselves. Podcasting has become perhaps the greatest way to push your ideas, your product, or even yourself to thousands of people who hang on to your every word. So if you would like to talk to me about starting your own podcast, contact me by going to jewishcoffeehouse.com or else write to me at scott at jewishcoffeehouse.com. Let me help you reach a massive audience and make it sound great. That's great. I am really excited to introduce our guest today, Beverly Damelin. We know each other for many years already. I'm going to let you, Beverly, kind of talk about yourself and what you do. I do want to start out by saying that we are going to be focusing today on sex toys. And my first question for you, Beverly, is going to be about whether sex toys are therapeutic whether they're meant to help people with difficulties or whether they're meant for other purposes to make things better. Do you need sex toys if you're not good enough or do you need sex toys if you just want things to be better? So that's one question I do want to say about sex therapy. Beverly is a sex therapist and there are many different kinds of sex therapists and who work in different ways. Beverly studied sex therapy specifically for disabled populations. I think that it's really important to probably even do a whole podcast episode on disabled populations. Some sex therapists, for example, I work very much psychologically. Some therapists work very much practically. And I have learned from your practical approach, your knowledge of the devices that are out there, your knowledge of you know, having your finger on the pulse of uh, what's going on in the world of sexuality and sexual health. So please, Beverly, you have the floor. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Tally and Scott. It's great to be with you. Let's start with this, that when I got into the world of sex toys, it was mostly as an educational means. It was a way to put my foot in the door to get talking about female sexuality with adult women. I thought that nobody's going to get together in their free time and have discussions on biology and and anatomy and problems we have with our partners. I'm talking about over 20 years ago. 
I use sex toys as a as a way of entertaining. And the more that um, I went for the entertainment angle, the more people came out with me at me with uh, questions about problems they were having, about communication, about changes. Uh, so it got the discussion going. It started off there, and as the years have gone by, I've seen that it's become more and more that uh, spectrum from just fun all the way to uh, education, therapy, and, and disorders. It's a continuum. And some people start off at some point, and then they find that you've opened the door, they can start discussing other things. Uh, but mostly we're getting the discussion going. We were opening up the subject. It's been a great journey. Okay, well, let's start, and I would love for Rabbi Scott to chime in on this, but let's just start with the idea of sex toys for the purpose of enhancement. And I think that I'm going to continue with questions later about using devices for helping, helping with issues, for example, of vaginal pain, or helping with issues of premature ejaculation or difficulties with erection, or even to replace things, certain sexual feelings that you may not get with your partner because your partner's not necessarily willing to do certain things. So they might be willing to do them using a device rather than their finger or their mouth or that kind of thing. We could certainly talk about that. But I just want to, in general, I mean, I know you work a lot with the religious population, and I think we'd be interested to know what sort of stuff do you recommend for enhancing marital intimacy physically. And I'd also like to know from you, Rabbi Khan, what does Judaism have to say about bringing sex toys into your bedroom, even from a philosophical, if not necessarily a halachic point of view? So maybe let's start with you, Scott, and then sure. can answer. I'll open up with the Gemara, a very short one. In Nida Daf Yudzayin Amud Aleph, 17a, there's an interesting discussion there. It says that the sages praised the house of Munbaz the king because of three particular, perhaps atypical sexual practices that were accustomed to be done there. One of them was that they had sex in the daytime. So the Gemara then asks, why is that a good thing? Meaning, even if you say that sex in the daytime is allowed, and that's a discussion whether it's allowed at all, but even assuming that it is allowed, why is that considered a good thing? And the Gemara answers, because then the husband won't be tired. Okay. Rashi explains why does that matter, and he says because a lack of sleep means a lack of desire. If the couple is having sex at night when the husband is tired, and the husband therefore is not that interested and he's doing it just for the mitzvah or just to appease his wife, then that's a bad thing. And for me, that was a fascinating Gemara to look at because this is actually a real source for the importance of, at least on the male side, having male sexual enhancement, for him to enjoy it. You'd think that the Gemara would say, if it's a mitzvah, that's the whole point. But here it's saying if they do a mitzvah alone, that's missing the point. Doing it only for the sake of the mitzvah without actually getting enjoyment is problematic. So to me, the idea of sexual enhancement can at least be seen from this Gemara as a real Jewish value. The sages praised them because they made sure that the husband and wife would both be interested. It wouldn't just be the wife in this case. The husband would also be excited and into it and not doing it just for the mitzvah. It sounds almost not like a Jewish way of thinking, doing it just for the mitzvah being not good enough. So the idea of enhancement, at least, is, I believe, is really suggested by this Gemara, as well as many other statements which we could find. To me, this was representative. In terms of sex toys per se, it's an interesting question. Are they allowed or not allowed? And frankly, from my research, I don't know why they wouldn't be allowed. Primarily, from what I see, the primary or main problem people would have about them is, number one, that they're often used for masturbation. Despite the fact that, as we've said before on this podcast, emphasizing guilt when trying to get people not to masturbate is counterproductive and ineffective, etc., etc., at the same time, let's acknowledge that Chazal say that male masturbation is prohibited. So to the degree that somebody purchases or uses sex toys specifically for the sake of male masturbation, that would be a problem. But we're not talking about male masturbation right now. We're talking about couples using this together together for enhancement of their joint sex lives together. And in that sense, I believe it would be, if anything, a positive if it works for them. The other problem would be what's effectively pornography, because very often sex aids, sex toys are sold in what might be described as pornographic packaging or with very pornographic style advertising, naked women, etc. And the concept in halacha of tumat enaim, things that 
a person should not and may not look at is very real. Let's not pretend that's not a problem. So to the degree that these products are advertised or sold in an untanua way, there actually is another halachic problem which can't be ignored. That's why there are some religious people who have opened up online stores which specifically sell sex toys but avoid the pornographic element that's associated with them. So if we can get out of that problem as well, I believe that altogether, halachically, there's no problem. That's important. That's important to say, because I think that a lot of very religious people or religious people um, might be averse to the idea of even purchasing sex toys, even though now it's easier with Amazon and um, you can order things online fairly easily. But, you know, there was a time you had to go into shops or you had to go into certain websites that, you know, were not uh, suitable for people to, to see. And I think that being able to say it's not about that. If it's about the actual devices, the actual devices are fine. Yeah, exactly. So so Beverly. Well, I think there's a long list of myths related to sex toys. Um, if we take a look at probably the most popular toy, which is a vibrator, uh, vibrators are meant for female pleasure. They can be used by men and they can be used in different ways. But I think that the first myth that comes to mind is, is the idea that if a woman receives a vibrator, she's uh, it's got something that's going to be in competition with her partner. That's why I like to tell people that toys are not another another person, another uh, individual, as much as it's like another position. It's being with the partner and being in different ways. That takes a lot of the, the pressure off, off that idea because a lot of, of women are worried about male ego, about the, the man feeling that there's something that this vibrator can do that he can't do. And quite honestly, there's something correct about that. Vibrators are more intense. They can give stimulation at a much higher level, um, but they can't make coffee or give a hug. So they're very different. They're there for different purposes. Uh, just like one position will give more, could be much more stimulating than another. So this could also be much more stimulating. It's got its pluses and its minuses. Can you kind of go through the most popular sex toys that are ordered from you or that you would recommend to couples. You talked about a vibrator. I know that women will use vibrators if they have difficulty reaching orgasm. So that can be something that is available for enhancement as well as for therapeutic reasons. I think that people are often confused. What's the difference between a vibrator and a dildo and a dilator? Um, can you talk about that? And can you also talk about what's available for male? enhancement as well. Okay. So first of all, vibrators versus dildos. Um, a dildo is basically an object that is similar in, in size and proportion to a penis, to an erect penis. Of course, there's a very wide range of them. Um, so there's options of, of very many sizes. Um, a vibrator is simply something that vibrates. So it's got uh, some electric uh, motor in it. Very often, the vibrators that we see are vibrators and dildos because they vibrate and they're something that's akin in size to a penis. Technically, an electric toothbrush is also a vibrator. A telephone, when it's on, uh, on vibrate, is a vibrator. So we can use a lot of different shapes. And if we think about female anatomy, a little ball can be a vibrator or a tiny little object the size of lipstick we are sometimes going to want different shapes because sometimes women want to, to penetrate with it um, or they want the option of sometimes using it externally. The vibrations are essentially effective on the clitoris and the, and the labia area, so externally. Uh, but some women like to use it internally. Some women don't. Very often, women will go for a large dildo-shaped vibrator and find that they never use it internally. So they're basically just lugging around a lot of weight a lot of battery power and a very important thing is the issue, issue of discretion. I've met with a lot of women who have said to me, oh, they've, they've got a vibrator, but they never used it. And if I asked them why they never used it, because there was something about it that was indiscreet. It looked, it was what we call realistic. It, it had a penis shape. It's a very often circumcised penis. It's very funny to think that these Chinese are creating circumcised penises when they've never actually seen one. But that's the, the going shape. Um, and, and women just feel very awkward now if I were to give them something that's the shape of lipstick. And it does the same it's job. Effective, and they're going to yeah. be likely to have it somewhere accessible. Women have told me that they've uh, got these very expensive vibrators that they pack so far behind at the back of their cupboard, at the very, very top shelf, 
that if they were to want it, it's such a hassle to get it out, and then they've got to repackage it and, and hide it again, or they're scared of it being found by their babysitter or their cleaner. So it's, it's just not practical. So this issue very often of, of something discreet and something that, that one's comfortable picking up and using is, is much more important to just make it accessible at the, first, at the first level. Take that idea away that it has to have any specific shape. And then it, they come in a million different colors. That's just a personal thing, like a choice of our taste in people. Some women are going to like a very dark color, like black, for reasons of nida, for example, if they're scared that there may be some bleeding. Some people are going to hate that color. Some people want to have something playful and pink. Pink and purple are, are really the, the popular colors. That's why a very large, if you walk into a shop, a lot of them are going to be in those colors. But that's some people's taste. And some people are going to like something that's, that's very playful. And some people are going to say, no, that's childish. I want something that, that's skin color, dark skin, light skin, whatever. There's a new area. Basically, there hasn't been a lot of change in, in, in vibrators over the years. It's just something with a motor. So the motors are cheaper or more expensive. They're battery or a USB. There's, there's, there's some technology that's gone in, but the idea has been very similar until pretty recently when it, it was a bit of a, a technological change. There's a new form of vibrator that actually has suction. And then it doesn't even have to really have, have contact with the body it just it can sort of hover above the uh, the labia or the that's the arrows uh, device. Yeah, called the satisfier there's ah, it's now okay. produced by d- different names and it just really draws blood in uh, to that area which really is 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 what physiologically happens to us when we're stimulated so there's a little bit of updates there but mostly there's just a million different shapes and every year every producer will be producing more and more so that they can just keep the sales going Functionally, they're not really very different. Well, isn't there the rabbit that uh, also penetrates but stimulates okay. the clitoris at the same time? So, right. Initially, all the, if we look back uh, into the, the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, basically, we had a lot of dildo-shaped vibrators until uh, there was a lot more talk about clitoris and clitoral stimulation and clitoral orgasm. And then I believe that women got more involved in the market. And once women became the people that were visiting the stores and that were choosing them. Changes started happening with the, the, the product merchandising and the packaging. What you mentioned before, if I think back in well, the 90s when I started purchasing, um, there were just a lot of products that were marketed to men. The men were the ones that were buying the products for the women. So therefore, we had things that were, that were very pornographic in nature. As soon as women got more involved... I guess it's, it's, a, it's a process of empowerment, also having money. Then suddenly the products started looking smaller, much more discreet. They, the boxes were white and um, there, were, there were a lot of details on them, but mostly um, there were things you could really put in your bag and not feel like you were going to be caught or, or seen. So, so that's it, the shapes, uh, shapes and sizes and, and, and things that they do. But there's another area of eggs that very often at the shops I get told or, or Clients come and mention to me that they've heard about these eggs. I think there are some products that, that to me don't make sense. And I will always say that, that everybody's got their own taste and some people just want to have a hundred different products. They want to have a big box under their bed and, and every night pull out something different. So let's just describe the egg. It looks like an egg, but it's smaller and it's supposed to be inserted and it's supposed to sit there in order to strengthen the pelvic floor muscles, which are meant to enhance the feeling of arousal because of stronger muscles, better blood flow. Is that what you're referring to? Right. So so, uh, very often the crossover between uh, things that are therapeutic and things that are for fun has begun a bit murky. And eggs is a great example because, as we mentioned, they could be the size of uh, ping pong balls. They could be slightly smaller. Uh, The idea is, is, as you say, to insert them like a tampon. They're just significantly wider than a tampon and they can have different levels of weight. And the idea really is, is to train those muscles. Now, it's, it's, not, it's not as much fun to do Kegel exercises as, as to use a vibrator. So they added in a vibration mechanism. And then we had these vibrating eggs and still a lot of talk of this is good for your, your pelvic floor. For a lot of women, internal stimulation or internal vibration is not going to do very much for them. And for a lot, it's, it's, it's just an exercise in, in failure doesn't really work, doesn't really feel good. So so there are some things that are a little bit confusing in there. That's one of those lines. Another issue is rings. 
basically penis rings. This is on the, the border between male and female because it's, it's a toy that's really made to use together. So describe what a penis ring no, is, please. A penis please. ring could be silicone, flexible um, ring about the size of, of, of a penis, an erect penis. Some of them will be smaller so that when they're placed on at the base of the penis, that they'll, they'll be tight. Um, some of them are going to be, they can be leather straps. In, in the world of the bondage uh, BDSM world, there's a lot of toys like that, but, but I'm not even getting into that, that whole area, just for the, the mere idea of, of really holding the blood flow inside the penis, uh, extending the, the erection. Um, really, it's, it's supposed to give more intense feeling of orgasm for the man. But at the same time, the idea is that it can give extra stimulation to the woman who's going to feel more girth at the base. Very often, not much is felt. Some of them vibrate and some of them just uh, have tightness to them. Some men are told that it works uh, for premature ejaculation or for losing their, uh, their erections. And I wouldn't call them therapeutic when we've got uh, problems that, that some things need to be treated the long, old-fashioned way. Uh, but I think that, that, that the general idea is that um, they're fun. They're fun and they're playful and they can create a, get a good laugh and that's what we're, when we're looking to upgrade an experience, uh, we just got to really introduce a little bit of novelty. You can't, you can't really have novelty every single time. It's, it's expensive and it, it becomes not novel. But for some couples, the idea of just bringing in a toy, something that's fun, something that's funny, something that's ludicrous sometimes, trying it out on each other, it's, it's actually an opportunity to talk to say, oh, that feels nice, or that doesn't feel nice. Or, or sometimes it's easier to say about the toy that you're holding, or you can do that more gently than to say it about the finger or part of, of an, an act that we've been doing for so long. I'd actually like to ask both of you a question, if it's okay. I'm curious what you both say about this. Beverly, earlier you mentioned how a husband can sometimes feel displaced by a sex toy like a vibrator. And you said, of course, a vibrator can't make coffee. And I respect that. I understand that. But at the same time, rightly or wrongly, many men, they associate their manliness, their masculinity with their sexual ability. And to say, well, you can't do that, but you can make coffee might not be an acceptable solution for many husbands. I bet a lot of them would be not happy to hear that answer. They'd still feel somehow that they're less than what they should be, or perhaps failing at a certain aspect of marriage. I'm curious how both of you would answer that question. If a husband did feel that way, should they stay away from sex toys or is there a way for this gap to be bridged? Okay, well, I think that sex is sex life of a couple is dynamic. And uh, sometimes it, it begins good and it, 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 it loses something and sometimes it, it picks up over the years. But we, we have to keep working on it. We've got to keep on making changes, making additions, um, talking more, opening up about things today that maybe I couldn't open up about two years ago. It's really, it's an instrument inside the relationship, the, the way I see it. But one thing we need to be aware of is that as we get on in age, our sex lives are going to change. Uh, male sexuality is going to go in, in, in a direction. There's less ability to orgasm with such ease. It's, it can be seen as something negative, but it's actually something that, that is very positive. Females may need to have more time or they may need less time if, if, if they, they have pain or, or, uh, or dryness. Uh, but we need to adapt to, to these ch our changing bodies. Sex toys can come in and help us along, help us adapt uh, to, to, our, uh, to, to these changes and, and accept them as there's a pro to that, to that side. You know, we're not, uh, we're not having the same sex as we were having in our 20s or our 30s. I like that answer. First of all, I really want to acknowledge and validate, Scott, what you're saying about, you know, the feeling that a man would have. Um, I think it goes for men and for women. There's something incredibly powerful about providing your partner with pleasure. And if your partner is preferring, whether through their own self-stimulation with a device or without a device, to get to it on their own. I think that we look at this as an opportunity to explore what the dynamics are in the relationship as well as what's going on for each person because you know very often people carry around a past 
that makes it very, very hard to let go, to let go with anybody. And very often a partner can personalize this and feel rejected by it. You know, she won't let me. She'll let the vibrator do it, but not me. When it's really not about the partner necessarily, it's about a process of inability to trust or inability to let go, which may very well be very much guided and caused by so many developmental factors in the past that has not allowed that person to just let go and relax. So very often there's a journey that can go from, you know, learning how to do it on your own and then with a vibrator and then having your partner gently over time be able to get to that point. It also gives me a lot of information about the partner and his insecurity This is not only true about vibrators, but there are men that sometimes will say, you know, my wife has vaginismus, she's unable to contain a penis. And when I see her putting in the dilators, which are, um, you know, little devices that graduate, they get bigger over time to help the woman kind of get used to the idea of penetration into her vagina and to become more relaxed about it and to also be able to experience it with less um, anxiety and with less pain. And he sees that. And I even had one patient that said, but no, I'm supposed to be the one to turn her into a kli. Like even he turned it into a halachic issue that the man has to be the one to actually change the status as if as if this device is going to turn her into a non-virgin. And I think that rather than get into an argument with the person, this is an opportunity to try to understand what that would mean for him to be the one to. And when did he not get to be the one to do things? in his life before. So as usual, I take a more psychodynamic approach to these very often behavioral technical questions because I see it as an opportunity. But when you were talking, Bev, I had a similar thought about the dependence on vibrators. And I've also had patients talk about what, and I think you also mentioned this when we spoke, what about women who really are unable to reach orgasm or experience orgasm unless they use a vibrator? And what do they do on Shabbat when they can't turn it on, turn it off? These are questions that do come up. Tali, I really want to reinforce something you brought up before I answer that, that uh, this question of, of who do, where does uh, female sexuality sit? And are women responsible for their own pleasure and for their own sexual feelings? Um, or is it something that just gets turned on by a man? Because I think that a woman that, that's grown up with a sense of, of control of, uh, over this, of, of allowance to be a sexual being is gonna have much less issues taking on a vibrator or other different toys or talking about it or uh, bringing him in and explaining. But not everybody starts at the same starting point. Another issue, what you bring up, the dependence on on vibrators, I think this is the biggest myth of them all, that it's some form of (laughs) motorized cocaine that, that you start it and then you can't go back. And I think that we need to understand human sexuality. I see this as a, as a big simplification. I understand that that males, if, if they don't have sex, the, the, the more the days go by or the weeks go by or the months go by, depending on the case, there's, there's going to be a greater will. There's going to be a greater need. Um, of course, this will stop at some point. Sort of the, the more sex, the, the lower, the, the, well, the, it keeps the drive lower. Like the, the, if we, the, a man stops having sex, the, the drive will go up at least initially. And for women, it can be almost the opposite, that as time goes by, that, that need passes. The need sort of dies out and there's, there's the, the drive um, can go down. I'm not talking about a relationship that's very emotionally strong, you know, just on a pure physical level. So this idea of, of a woman having something that can awaken her sexuality with or without him actually plays towards the couple and, and the, their sexuality. If she's charging herself, I think that spills over into the relationship. Absolutely. I'm going to put it in a little bit of a different way. You know, what I like to say is that sex is really about holding on to yourself and holding on to a partner at the same time. And this is really very much about using the theory of differentiation. You know, we don't give over ourselves 100%. We hold on to ourselves and we have to have our own sense of self and separate it 
from the other person. And then we have to be able to merge with the other person and have space for that as well. So the idea is, is that we don't give our sexuality to another person. It's ours. And we do need to have our own sense of agency and autonomy over it. But we also can choose to let go of that in order to experience what it feels like to let go and allow your partner. And again, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's with a device or without a device. It's really about, you know, holding on to yourself, communicating with yourself, because you can't just completely disconnect from what your body needs. Part of the experience is connecting to what your body needs and connecting to your partner and his or her needs at the same time. And that's really the ideal of what a sexual experience is like. Moving along, I mean, we've talked about vibrators and penis rings. I'm actually quite interested in simulators, so to speak. So for example, if a man or a woman is interested in anal pleasure and the partner doesn't want to use their finger. Is there a device that can be used to provide anal pleasure? That's number one. Number two, what about oral sex? If a woman or a man want oral sex, but the partner is averse to it or hesitant, are there devices that can simulate oral sex? Obviously that they would do together. I'm actually interested in asking this question to both of you. Also in terms, Scott, of, you know, what do you think is the Jewish approach to um, these sort of devices, if there's any difference between the devices that we've already talked about. I know that there are things called a masturbation sleeve, and I imagine from the name alone that that might uh, turn off some of our listeners, and I wonder what that is and if there's a way to use that in a couple setting. I'll start off with the with anal um, there's a, a device called a plug, and an anal plug is something that is designed specifically for this orifice. The difference between the, the vaginal opening and the and the anal opening, well, the, the openings are, are, are very similar. They're both very sensitive, but the vagina is closed, or at least at the end there's a cervix. It's very difficult uh, to get past that cervix. And that needs to be done, you know, only for medical procedures. But nothing can get really lost inside a, a, a vagina. So even if there are eggs or um, other small toys and by, by mistake they, they get in, you know, sometimes a woman can clench up. But when she relaxes or with a little bit of help, it, uh, a finger can get it out. So there's no real danger there. With the rectum... Basically, um, it's, it's connected to a very, very long path of the digestive system. So um, things can, uh, well, if you can put it like they can get lost there, uh, they can get stuck. So anything that's used anally needs to have a very wide brim so that it doesn't get caught. This anal plug is really designed, it starts off very narrow and it, and it widens. It really has a design that, that about one inch in, it's two centimeters or so. There's just a um, an area that's wider, and then it sort of puts pressure on a very sensitive area for the men, the prostate area. It's putting pressure on an uh, on an existing spot that's that's very sensitive, and it's got a wide ending. So that that's that's what's important for a lot of people. Um, they're very happy with the idea. You know, we can't really uh, start arguing with people about the, the sense of of where to touch and how to touch. But for, for people that are interested, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasurable area and it's a very intimate act to go into uh, things that, that we wouldn't have done in the past or that we hadn't felt comfortable and, and we're, we're taking ourselves uh, into another area. Having said that, I, I say the same thing about uh, oral, anal, um, toys. There's a very wide range of things and we don't need to do all of them. Not everybody has to possess a vibrator. Um, not everybody has to try any act. I think you've got to try something as a thing that they teach, you know, people who write for Cosmopolitan or Guy magazines. But uh, it's a commercial thing. With sex, we, we get to choose. As long as there is some kind of range, I, I think that, um, that there's nothing that needs to be. Um, as far as oral sex, I haven't um, managed to, to find anything that I think is, is, is effective some people say what I mentioned before, the, uh, those suction vibrators, that they're similar, but in my opinion, they're m way more intense. Oral sex is, is very intimate. It's very gentle. 
So I think that there's some things that are just can't be can't be done. I've seen toys that have like a little tongue shape and even some of them that roll around and have like various tongues that give the sense of licking, uh, but it's not the same. It's, it's motorized, it's, um, it's intense. Some things just can't be replicated. In terms of what Jewish law would say about some of the ideas you mentioned, Beverly and Tali, I'm sure that it's multivocal, as is everything that we've been talking about in this podcast. But I think from one perspective, actually, I would guess, though I can't say for sure, that certain post games, certain halachic decisors might even say that some of these various sex toys might even be better than a person doing it on his own. We talked about this, I believe it was episodes 8, 16, and 30, if I recall correctly, about wow. the halachic... That's good. <laughs> That's real <laughs> bakias there. <laughs> yeah. The uh, halachic propriety of whether it's oral sex, anal sex, what's called in halacha the three categories, kedarka, which means vaginal sex, shalok kedarka, which generally means anal sex, and derech evarim, which means basically any other kind of non-vaginal ejaculation that's done together, whether it's oral sex and the like. Some people allow it and some people don't. From the perspective of those who don't allow it, perhaps a sex toy that could replicate that experience for the ones who wants it while avoiding the possibility of non-vaginal ejaculation might even be a positive according to those decisors. So from that perspective, I think that would probably be the most likely scenario for those who have a problem with it. On the other hand, to me, at least on a hashkafic or philosophical level, I think the most important point, regardless of what one thinks halachically about non-vaginal sex, is that the couple is doing this together. I think any sort of toy or any other device that would cause the one of the partners or both of the partners to go more into themselves and to feel less connected to the partner, if it somehow serves to bring them apart rather than bring them together, even if they're doing it on some level together, that might be somewhat counterproductive, again, speaking philosophically or emotionally, not even halakhically right now, I would hope that to the degree that a couple uses them, they're using them to enhance their relationship and not just their own private sexual pleasure. That might not halakhically be termed masturbation, but hashkafically, it probably is, I would say, somewhat counterproductive. So I would hope that toys would be used to enhance rather than to bring each partner into him or herself. So that brings me back to the masturbation sleeve in the event that a woman is unable to have intercourse. Let's say she has a sexual pain disorder or she's, you know, there's so many reasons why there could be cancer treatments, radiation, all kinds of reasons why there's a vaginal issue that prevents intercourse. And there's something called a sleeve, which feels, I guess, supposed to feel close to a vagina. And if she's part of that... Uh, would that be considered a good solution, both from a, you know, Beverly, from a sex therapy point of view, and you, Scott, from a halachic point of view? It's a difficult call. There are so many different factors involved and different opinions that come into play. al regal as they say, which means just off the top of my head, I think it's really relevant to what we discussed in talking about derech evarim, which means non-vaginal and non-anal sexual intercourse. According to those opinions that say that Derech Evarim is allowed occasionally, meaning not as their primary form of intercourse, but as a secondary thing that they do. And particularly if the reason that they're doing it is because the woman cannot have vaginal intercourse for whatever reason, that makes it even more likely to be allowed by more authorities. In that situation, it would seem that it probably is the same kind of thing would fall into that category if they're doing it together. I'd like to emphasize that point, that this is something that they're doing together. If we're talking about something that has halakha propriety, it is something that they'll be doing together, not something that the guy is doing by himself. That's my feeling about the propriety of the masturbation sleeve. Once again, that's just all regalachat. I think um, what we've said so many times, it's, it's how things are done. Just a little bit more information on a sleeve. Um, there's a lot of different things. Some of them are feel entirely uh, or made to feel like vaginas. They have a skin-like feeling. They have a wetness. You add uh, lubricant to them, and and um, and they're supposed to to feel very accurate. Others are just meant to be very very intense. They have um, little silicone um, coils inside, and a lot of different uh, textures, which just give a very intense. Uh, a sensation but if if a man is having a hard time this more in the, in the therapy area having a very difficult time reaching orgasm and it's creating pain there could be a, have a, a, a female partner who doesn't have any problems but but having intercourse for 40, for, for 45 minutes is going to cause problems so there's a way that it just could be combined uh, to bring him to a level of, of very high stimulation and then start the intercourse we can also teach each other. We can teach each other with using a sleeve how we like to be touched, how intense. 
sometimes the, the visual, the ability to get visual, to switch on the lights and, and to look at things, it's a progression in our, in our openness, in our sexual communication. So there's a, there's a lot of little advantages. I, I guess it all comes down to how we're going to use it. I can't let you leave without two other subjects that we have to raise. One is lubricants. How do you know what's good? How do you know what kind? There's all kinds. There's gel, there's water-based, there's silicone, there's oils. We actually did a little promo for cannabis oil earlier in the episode. So what, what's your take on these products? Obviously, there's often a technical necessity for these products, and sometimes they're just used for enhancement. Some of them, I guess, have, I don't know, some kind of like eucalyptus or some kind of warming component to them. What is your experience with working with lubricants? All right. So fortunately for us uh, in Israel, we have much less of a range than, than what exists, for example, in the States. Um, I once went into Target and, and almost fainted at the enormous range. So that's, that's less of a problem uh, in most of the world. As you said, uh, water-based lubricants are the cheapest Some of them are simple. Some of them are just uh, basically glycerin, water, and some stabilizer. Some of them have extra things inside. If we buy that, we need to read the ingredients. Oil-based, it could be pure oil. There's a lot of different oils. The best oils to use, uh, in my opinion today, is uh, coconut or almond oil. Different therapists have have their own choices, but the cleaner the oil is, uh, generally, the more expensive, it's it's going to be uh, finer and less scratchy. The cheap oils are going to, if you look under a microscope, they're, they're really dirty, not to mention having a smell. But they all basically work. The water-based is the most similar to our natural lubrication, which is the ideal thing. Um, we're using lubricants because we need to add to our natural, or for some women who are dry, it could be hormonal, it could be because they're on medication, it could be just they're stressed out. It's always good to have some lying around because people need it uh, at different points and, and it's, uh, it's good to have in the cupboard. Another new form of, of lubricant, relatively new, is silicone-based. Silicone is wonderful in that it, um, it's very, very smooth and it doesn't dry out. The molecule, molecules don't get absorbed into the body very easily. So it just stays, stays wet, but it can't be used with silicon toys or the situations where, where we can't use it and it's uh, it can be dangerous to use in the shower or the bath it just doesn't wash off with water but I believe that that some women are not sensitive they can take the simplest thing off the shelf and, and it'll be fine for them worst comes to the worst it dries up a bit use some more but for somebody who's sensitive they're going to land up having a bathroom cupboard that is filled with different things that they tried out. You try it. This, if it doesn't suit you, it's going to basically start off with a tingling feeling or a scratchy feeling. Just stop using it. I don't know of anybody that's had a more a severe reaction. That, that's it's trial and error. Um, there are a lot of organic products that are usually safer, but um, for some people, it's just going to be a lot of, a lot of attempts. Ordering online, there's, there's a lot of products available. Now, Tali, let me just chime in very quickly for something which is really a by the way, but a lot of people actually have asked about the propriety of using lubricants on Shabbat because there's a malacha, one of the forbidden actions on Shabbat called memareach, which is smearing. I'll just say that the answer is it depends on the lubricant. If it's a cream or a thick jelly type of lubricant, then there actually is a halachic problem with using it on Shabbat. On the other hand, if it's more of a water type of consistency, such that it's much more of a liquid more than a gel, then there's a likelihood that it's less memoriach. Obviously, a person has to see the exact substance. I can't just say on a podcast, which is which, but if it is more of a, a clear, like a, a water type liquid, then there's less of a Shabbat problem. It, that kind of thing would be allowed on Shabbat. The others would not. And I'll add in here that um, you know, what's the reason that we're using lubricant? If it's if it's something that we need to be able to, we, we sex is not something, penetration is not something that should be happening in a dry vagina. It's dangerous. It's 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 harmful. It sets in a, a negative process. Is it being used as a an essential part, or is it something that we're just ad- adding for effect? And tell you mentioned, for example, the warming. There's a lot of uh, new products that are that are there for people that don't need them, just want to add in, uh, let's have fun. Let's add strawberry flavor or chocolate or some sweetness. Um, that's sort of suggesting oral sex. It's, it's not quite strawberry flavored lubricant. It's not the, the taste of fresh strawberries. They're, they're not usually such a great uh, taste issue. Uh, but the warming idea is, is something that's, that's fun. 
it's got some chemicals in it that when there's friction, it, it gives a, a, a warming sensation and really is, it's fun. But for somebody who's sensitive to put chemicals into the vagina, it's absolutely not necessary and it's going to cause a reaction. Um, there's another issue of creams for men. Um, sometimes there's creams that, uh, that take down the sensation so that they don't uh, ejaculate fast. That's also very problematic because that cream... Or sprays. Or, or sprays. sprays, right. Uh, sometimes it's, it's condoms with these things inside. Sometimes it's toys that they're rubbed on. If it's taking down the sensation in the male, it's going to be taking down the sensation in the female with whom he has contact. And, and then, you know, what are we doing there? All these things that have got extra chemicals in them to... to we, you know, a, a non-sensitive person will probably get away with it with no issues, but we really should be careful what we put inside us. Thanks. So just to add to what you're saying about lubricants, it's really a good opportunity. We want to have the lubricant available to enhance the experience. Um, we don't want to use lubricant in order to allow unaroused penetration to occur. And that is important because very often in the beginning of marriage and Kala teachers um, may often suggest lubrication, which is great. It's important to suggest it. But the idea is, is that we want to also educate the Kalot that her natural lubrication, which would occur as a result of feeling sexually aroused, is really the indication, just like an erect penis would be, that you're ready for the penetration. And just using lubricant in a non-aroused vagina is not really the idea here. So this is a good opportunity. Having said that, I do think it's important to clarify something as we move towards the life cycle of the uh, couple. There are times where a woman can feel very aroused in her head, but not lubricate in her genitals. And there are also times where there will be lubrication when there is not necessarily arousal. We call this genital non-concordance in the sense that there are times, especially having to do with um, the life cycle, if it's uh, a nursing mother or menopause, that a woman will feel aroused, but not necessarily will lubricate. And of course, we do know that the body will often provide lubrication, even if there isn't objective experience of arousal. The last thing, and I know we're really out of time, but I think, you know, it's, it, we cannot have you to this program without talking about this. If there is an interest, uh, listeners, please write us because we would be willing to have Beverly back for another episode on this topic. I know that you work with a disabled population, and if you could just talk for a couple minutes about how you help people with disabilities and if there are specific devices available to people who have different sorts of physical disabilities to allow them to engage in in sex. Um, and I know that that's a whole lot to ask in a nutshell, because that's basically your profession. But if you could just give us some bullets. Okay, so whether we're um, starting with a relationship starting off with disability, or it's something that happens along the way, it's something that needs to be seen as, uh, as one of those changes that happens in our long life of, of many sexual changes that happen. And there's absolutely no reason that sex ends because our bodies or our mental status or uh, any other changes or disabilities occur. Sex is all about adaptation. It's about um, getting the message out there. If it's because we need to change the way we're passing the information over, or we need to come up with ideas, a lot of creativity, that's the fun part of, of the sex therapy, just really being challenged to come up with ways to keep sexuality alive. And sexuality, as we know, is not about penetration. Uh, it's about touch and it's about attraction and it's about feelings. And there's so much there to work with. Beverly, how can a couple who are experiencing problems in their sex life because of disability contact you in order to arrange a session or for advice? Do you have an email address? Do you have other ways of contacting you? We'll certainly put that information in the show notes as well. I'm on Instagram and on Facebook and on a few other forums. Just Google Bev or Beverly Damlin. Zoom has been incredible in how it has opened up. Uh, also because people with, the, with rare disorders uh, aren't necessarily living close to people who deal with speciality areas. Um, so that's been, that's been incredible. 
Thanks so much for joining us today. Before we go, I want to first of all thank my friend, Rabbi Yaakov Shapiro, who first of all is a wonderful person, a great human being. But second of all, in preparing for this episode, I contacted him to see if he had any particular approaches to the idea of sex toys and enhancing intimacy. And he was very, very helpful. And I wanted to give Hakar to Tov to him for giving me ideas of ways to approach this particular issue. I also want to give an unsolicited suggestion that everybody purchase Tali Rosenbaum's fine book. She wrote it together with David Ribner, I Am For My Beloved, A Guide to Enhanced Intimacy for Married Couples. This book also contains a whole section on sex toys and is really a phenomenal book. So everyone should go out and get that. A link to purchase it will be in the show notes as well. Thanks. Make sure to visit our website, IntimateJudaism.com. You can find the full podcast archive there and much more. Send us your questions to IntimateJudaism at JewishCoffeeHouse.com. Visit JewishCoffeeHouse.com and TaliaRosenbaum.com. And make sure to become a patron on Patreon. You can find the link in the description of this podcast. Bye, everyone. Bye. This episode of Intimate Judaism is brought to you by My Shemin Pleasure Massage Oil. My Shemin is a new natural and safe lubricant designed to help with relaxation and arousal. It is composed of multiple oils including cannabis to help reduce muscle tension, improve blood flow, and stimulate sexual responsiveness. My Shemin Oil works in harmony with your body's natural mechanisms, soothing and stimulating blood flow to achieve a strong aphrodisiac effect. My Shemin is a great tool for couples who want to explore sensual touch as well as for any couple that wants to try something new in order to improve and enhance their intimate experiences. My Shemin is located in Israel and can be shipped all over the world. It's approved by the Israel Ministry of Health and a single bottle can be used between 30 and 50 times. Go to the show notes for this episode at IntimateJudaism.com where you can find a link to order or go to myshemin.co.il. That's M Y. S-H-E-M-E-N dot C-O dot I-L to help you and your partner improve and enhance your intimate experience.